right. Well, we are in 1 John, <clears throat> finally at the first verse of the second chapter of 1 John. <clears throat> it's only taken us a year to get here, <clears throat> but uh, we are there. 1 <clears throat> John chapter 2, verse number 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, <clears throat> that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the the righteous, and that's <coughs> that's the verse that we're focused on. <clears throat> our divine defense attorney, and uh, we're looking at that last sentence, that last phrase. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. <clears throat> and John puts this in uh, in a setting of a uh, of legal language, <clears throat> of looking at it that way. <clears throat> as a, a courtroom type of setting. Uh, it presumes uh, people standing accused before God, the divine judge. <clears throat> and Christ comes in as our, uh, our defense attorney, as the sinner's defense attorney. And, it, and it's <clears throat> introducing us to a, uh, an aspect of salvation that's very important, but oftentimes gets overlooked or misunderstood and it's that salvation <clears throat> is a matter of divine justice. It's a matter of divine justice. Now, <clears throat> uh, many have wrongly thought that, that somehow or another between God's love and God's justice, his love for us overpowers his justice and <clears throat> therefore he's able to save believers. <clears throat> And that simply is not true. <clears throat> Both God's love and God's justice are equally satisfied <clears throat> in obtaining our salvation <clears throat> and God's salvation plan. They're both equally important and both equally satisfied. And <clears throat> the whole experience of reading the first epistle of John would be an overwhelming experience Um if it wasn't for this initial introduction of the fact <clears throat> that we have a divine defense attorney, <clears throat> uh, if it didn't start out with this initial emphasis on, uh, on forgiveness <clears throat> and advocacy, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> our text verse, chapter 2, verse 1, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Uh, um, verse 12 of chapter 2 also says, I write unto you little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. So those are, those are really important statements <clears throat> because this book otherwise would be an overwhelming message for us. And we looked at a lot of verses last week in 1 John uh, that, uh, in which John essentially is laying out the characteristics of a true believer, of a born-again believer. And he's saying <clears throat> things like, Christians don't walk in darkness. They always walk in the light. Christians are eager to confess their sins. Christians obey God's commands. He keeps their commands. <clears throat> they obey his word. Uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 11 says, He that saith he's in the light and hateth his brothers in darkness even until now. So John says Christians love their brothers. If you don't love your brother, you're in darkness. And if you're in darkness, <coughs> then you're not a believer. Um, um, Christians don't love the world. He points that out. They don't love the evil system of the world. They don't love what's in the world, the lust of the eyes, <coughs> the pride of life. <coughs> um, And he goes on and on and on throughout this entire book, uh, listing these characteristics of people who are truly saved. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now that's straightforward. He's saying Christians don't sin. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> that becomes a problem for us. Chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. 
and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Again, he's saying the same thing, different words. Christians obey God's commands. Christians demonstrate love one to another. <clears throat> John just keeps circling back through these same basic elements over and over again, saying if you're a true believer, then you walk in the light, you don't walk in darkness, you love the kingdom of God, you don't love the world, <clears throat> you obey God's commands, you don't practice sin, you love your brothers. These are the tests that he gives over and over again throughout the book of 1 John, <clears throat> saying it over and over again. <clears throat> but just looking at those verses, it can stop you right dead in your tracks because you're saying, whoa, I don't qualify. I don't match up to that. My love is not perfect. My obedience is not perfect. I'm not sinless. I'm not always unattracted to the world. I'm not free from all sin. I'm not free from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I just don't pass the test that he's laying out. <clears throat> it's almost as though he is saying that once you get saved, you live sinlessly. <clears throat> and that's the only way that you could pass the test. <clears throat> is to be absolutely as perfect as Jesus Christ. We might conclude <clears throat> that this book is basically saying once you've been saved, once you've been forgiven, you're expected to live perfectly. <clears throat> and if you don't live perfectly, then you're not actually a Christian. And you could read this book that way, except for one statement. Mm -hmm. Chapter 2, verse 1. Yep. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> this is the doctrinal Mount Everest of the doctrine of salvation. <clears throat> it's a pinnacle of re of the redemptive plan of God. <clears throat> he uh, starts out saying, "My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not." <clears throat> well, that seems to just tighten the noose around our our neck, <clears throat> but it goes on to say that we have an advocate. Um, and we know who he's talking to here. He uses that phrase, my little children. And he uses it <clears throat> over and over again throughout this book. <clears throat> Verse 12, I write unto you little children. Verse 13, I write unto you little children because you've known the Father. Verse 18, little children. Verse 28, and now little children. Chapter 3, verse 7, little children. Verse 18, my little children. Chapter 4, verse 4, ye are of God little children. He's talking about the fact that believers are the children of God, that they have received salvation from God. <coughs> and I pointed out last week, the Greek construction of that phrase that's translated <coughs> as, and if any man sin, <coughs> it's put in such a way in the Greek language as saying, if, and we know it's going to happen. <coughs> and the word and there is the, the word chi, which means if and when. In other words, it's not saying, you know, you might be one of the ones that sin after you get saved. <clears throat> no, it's saying, it's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. <clears throat> Christians still are sinners. They're saved sinners. <clears throat> and the we that John uses here is referring back to little children. <clears throat> the we <clears throat> of the little children, when he says we have an advocate with the Father, he's talking about the we of the little children. <clears throat> he says he's the propitiation for our sins. <clears throat> That's the same we of the little children. <clears throat> it's the we who have an advocate with the Father. <clears throat> we have a propitiation, a substitution. <clears throat> and then it's this key to the doctrine of salvation. If we sin, and we will, <clears throat> we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. <clears throat> if we sin, and when we sin, and we will sin, we have an advocate. We have a defense attorney before the Father. <clears throat> and 
going back to this this idea of this imagery <clears throat> from chapter two, verse one, <clears throat> of a sinner in the court of divine justice. God is on the bench. His responsibility is to hold the hold up the perfection of His holy law. He is just, <clears throat> and He will render justice. We are the indicted sinner in His courtroom. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the defense lawyer who pleads the case <clears throat> on our behalf before the bar of Almighty and Holy God. <clears throat> And as we look at this deeper, we'll see the richness of our salvation. And we learn that salvation is not just an act of grace. It's not just an act of love or an act of mercy. But in fact, it actually is an act of justice, an act of divine justice. So that God's love is not overpowering his justice. His, his love is not, uh, or his mercy is not overwhelming his justice. His compassion is not simply stronger than his love of justice. <clears throat> in fact, they are simply working together in perfect harmony <clears throat> in the doctrine of salvation. And this is something that a lot of people simply <clears throat> either have a shallow understanding or a misunderstanding of, <clears throat> that the gospel is not simply a matter of grace, a matter of mercy, but in fact it is also a matter of justice being accomplished. <clears throat> the New Testament makes it clear and unmistakable that justice was not ignored by God in order to bring about salvation. Justice was not compromised. It wasn't set aside in order to grant us salvation. Justice was met. The terms of it were met. Justice was satisfied so that the salvation that God offers is the perfect action of divine justice and divine grace. <clears throat> and that allows God, according to, I'm sure you've read this verse before, <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse number 25, allows God to be both just and the justifier <clears throat> of the sinners who believe on Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so this matter of understanding that salvation operates in the realm of justice, it's not something that's actually obscure in the New Testament, even though it oftentimes gets overlooked or misunderstood. Um, here's a verse that I'm sure you've heard before that Paul spoke. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God <clears throat> unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's Romans chapter 1, verse number 6. <clears throat> and the very next verse, Paul says, for therein, in what? What is he talking about? In the gospel. For therein, the justice or the righteousness of God is revealed. So the righteousness of God, the justice of God is actually revealed in the gospel. It's not just a revelation of mercy, <clears throat> although it certainly is one, or a revelation of the love of God, although it certainly is one. <clears throat> the, re the revelation of the gospel is also a gospel of justice, of God's justice. <clears throat> Back in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He's performing an act of justice when he grants continuing forgiveness to the believing sinner. <clears throat> That's kind of hard to comprehend that. Does justice grant us forgiveness? Wouldn't it seem that because we're guilty sinners, that justice wouldn't be able to forgive us, and therefore somehow it would be simply God's love overpowering his justice? But that's not what the, what the New Testament is teaching us. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> so his graciousness then in forgiving us is actually an act of justice. And I know it sounds contra contradictory, may seem contradictory, <clears throat> that mercy and justice seem to contradict one another, <clears throat> that either you get mercy or you get justice. If you get mercy, that means that you're not getting what you deserve. So how can that be justice? Or if you get justice, then you're getting them what you deserve. And how could that be mercy? <clears throat> they sound like they should be mutually exclusive because of this misunderstanding that justice somehow requires the guilty <clears throat> to be punished. And if God is just, then we ought to be punished. <clears throat> how could he be merciful and just to the same person at the same time? <clears throat> 
because God is indeed, he is a God of justice. That is seen <clears throat> throughout the scripture. It's particularly evident <clears throat> in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, And the Lord passed before him, speaking of Moses, in front of Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, <clears throat> forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Now that all sounds great. That's exactly what we want. <clears throat> He's abounding in loving kindness and truth. He keeps loving kindness for thousands. He forgives iniquity and transgressions and sins. And then it says, and that by no means clear the guilty. And <clears throat> there's no trade-off here. There's no sacrifice of justice. There's no um, uh, um, replacing mercy. I'm sorry, replacing justice with mercy. He is both merciful and just. We see it again in Numbers chapter 14. It says, The Lord is long-suffering <clears throat> and of great mercy, mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty. Here it is saying God is long-suffering and of great mercy. He forgives iniquity. He forgives transgression and doesn't clear the guilty. Proverbs 11, 21, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. Nahum chapter 1, verse number 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. They will not be held guiltless. <clears throat> Isaiah 45, verse 21, tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together, who hath declared from ancient time, and who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God beside me, a just God and a Savior? A just God and a Savior. <clears throat> right in the same breath, he declares his justice and that he is also the Savior. <clears throat> and there's texts like that throughout the Bible. And you could simply put it this way. The scripture teaches that every single sin will be punished. <clears throat> every single sin will be punished. Matthew 10, 28, the Lord said, There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. He reiterated it again in Luke chapter 12, verse 3, that, <clears throat> that even the hidden sins that are unknown, perhaps even unknown <clears throat> or unaccounted for by the sinner, himself or herself, they shall be reckoned with because God is just. And justice cries for retribution. Every sin will be accounted for. Every sin is on the record. <clears throat> Every sin demands punishment. No sin ever committed by anybody at any time, known or unknown, <clears throat> is going to go unpunished. It's a question of who's the one receiving the punishment. God's mercy is not some mitigating sentimentality that simply softens or weakens or replaces justice. <coughs> God's truth is that absolute justice has to be satisfied and will be satisfied. And at the same time, mercy will be given to the guilty. And <coughs> a lot of presentations of the gospel fix on God's love and rarely ever consider his justice, <clears throat> his holy hatred of sin. And <clears throat> you can find plenty of preachers, radio, TV, elsewhere, <clears throat> that love to talk about the love of God and hardly ever mention God's demand for judgment of sin. <clears throat> How often have you heard, or have you ever even heard, a preacher say, no sin committed by anyone will ever go unpunished. But that is the truth. <clears throat> no sin is going to go unpunished. <clears throat> if justice is to be satisfied, then sin must be punished, and it certainly will be. And what is the price for that sin? Well, we know the verse. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. <clears throat> there will never be mercy without justice. And that's the realm that John is 
dealing with <clears throat> in this text. If anyone sins, John could have said he pays because that's consistent with God's justice. <clears throat> but he says instead, we have an advocate with the Father, <clears throat> Jesus Christ the righteous. So justice demands punishment. Mercy cries out for rescuing the sinner. <clears throat> and the gospel is, is <clears throat> the gospel meaning the good news. <clears throat> the good news is not that God is going to punish every sin. That's not good news. <clears throat> That's <clears throat> Uh, not something that we're going to cheer about. <clears throat> the good news is that every sin will be punished, and yet the sinner who is born again, who has put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, they will be forgiven because the forg for the punishment for their sin was placed on Christ. God will save sinners and satisfy his mercy and satisfy justice. So back in this courtroom, concept again. <clears throat> you look at the indictment. If anyone sins, and he will, well, we're talking here about believers. <clears throat> if we say that we don't sin, well, we saw in verse 8 of chapter 1 that we're a liar and the truth isn't in us. <clears throat> if we say we don't sin, chapter uh, 1 verse 10 says we're making God a liar and the truth is not in us. <clears throat> we're in God's courtroom and standing there, we are guilty. The judge knows we're guilty. <clears throat> um, this is particularly interesting. The judge knows we're guilty because he's got the complete record of our sins. <clears throat> even though we've been regenerated, even though that previously unbroken pattern of living a life of sinfulness has now been broken, and we have new desires and holy aspirations and a desire to walk in righteousness and have established a new pattern of walking in righteousness, it is still sometimes interrupted by sin. We still fail. And we still mess up. Uh, <clears throat> and so consequently, we still are sinners. <clears throat> we don't always follow God the way we should. <clears throat> we don't always love other Christians the way we should. We still sin. The indictment's clear. And the judge knows we're guilty, and we know we're guilty. And even more amazingly, our advocate, our defense attorney, knows we're guilty. <clears throat> you know, they, you see it in TVs and movies all the time. Uh, uh, if you watch uh, lawyer shows, they don't ever want to ask you whether or not you're guilty because it might interfere with the defense that they're planning on putting on. <clears throat> so... And there, there's, believe it or not, that, that might sound unethical. That's actually their ethical rules <clears throat> is because you can't put somebody on the stand if you know that they're going to perjure themselves, various things like that. So that's part of the reason that they don't bother to ask the question. <clears throat> but in God's court, <clears throat> on the part of everybody involved, has a perfect knowledge of our guilt. The indictment is settled. We're guilty in the courtroom. We're introduced to the prosecutor. Now, it's not talked about in these verses, but we know who the prosecutor is. <clears throat> the one who appears uh, and is eager to force the case against us before the divine judge. He wants to come to the bar and point to the indictment and the record of our sins, which is complete, and demand that God be true to his own justice and damn us to hell. That is, of course, Revelation 12.10 says he's the devil and Satan, and he's called the accuser of the brethren. He accuses them before our God day and night. Satan's a busy guy. <clears throat> and uh, he's not omnipresent, but he is fast. <clears throat> and uh, most people think that he's down here all the time messing up our little lives. And <clears throat> I sincerely doubt that he has much of anything to do with you individually. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of his work, his machinations, his efforts is to bring accusations against us in the courtroom of God. He is our adversary and he's a hateful prosecutor. <clears throat> um, some people are prosecutors and they do it because that's their job. <clears throat> um, in my case, my one of my three, at least two of the three prosecutors, I think hated my guts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the uh, the day of our indictment, I remember sitting there in the courtroom the day 
that we were indicted. And I happened to look over at him at the other table, and he was looking at me with the largest grin I've ever seen. I mean, it was positively satanic. It was... <clears throat> now, I guess he was probably trying to message me saying, I finally got you. He didn't get the reaction he thought he was going to get because I busted out laughing. Um, <laughs> I saw his, saw his face. But, I mean, <clears throat> he, he over and over throughout the years <clears throat> leading up to that case and that case, he demonstrated his hatred of me. Satan hates us. <clears throat> he absolutely hates us. And he cries for our punishment, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> pointing to our list of iniquities. So we're in this courtroom. The indictment, it's clear. Everybody there knows that we're guilty. <clears throat> and our accuser is demanding our eternal execution. <clears throat> we meet the judge. Who's the judge? Well, <clears throat> verse 1 of chapter 2, anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Our advocate is with the Father. So the Father is the judge. Our advocate goes before the Father. He advocates with the Father. He is, of course, God the Father. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> so we know who the judge is. The one before whom we stand is guilty. The one before whom the prosecutor brings the indictments <clears throat> of our sin and cries against us for damnation. And this isn't a jury trial, by the way, which we can be thankful for. Uh, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I can't, I can't even talk about this without obviously thinking a lot about my own trial, my own federal trial. It lasted 13 weeks. It was <clears throat> um, considered news newsworthy in various places. We had people show up to watch our trial from time to time. Well, every day there was some people there just to watch the trial. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I can't even explain to you the surreal feeling of sitting in a federal courtroom <clears throat> and uh, realizing that <clears throat> you're not there as an observer, you're sitting at the defense table. <clears throat> And realizing the most powerful human government on the planet is your adversary. And they have sent specialists from Washington, D.C. for this super complicated tax case with the, with the goal of putting you in prison for as long as they possibly could. <clears throat> and, and seeing they've got three prosecutors on their side <clears throat> and a fourth one sitting up on the bench <clears throat> because the judge did everything he could to make sure that we got convicted. <clears throat> and I remember how bizarre it felt to realize <clears throat> as the trial progressed that you're being falsely accused <clears throat> and that the prosecutors are manipulating the jury <clears throat> and there's not anything you can do about it. They are twisting the minds of the jury. The jury has no real sense, <clears throat> at least in our case, of the facts of our case. <clears throat> and it was fully permitted by the judge. Because as, as I've said to you before, <clears throat> we were not permitted to present any expert witness testimony on our behalf. This was a very complicated tax case involving trusts and other entities around the world and very <clears throat> um, obscure tax codes and regulations and case law, etc. <clears throat> and we were not allowed to present the testimony of any expert witnesses <clears throat> two weeks before trial. The government asked to not allow us to have expert witnesses, and the judge granted it. <clears throat> but I'm going to read you just a couple paragraphs because one of my co-defendants' families <clears throat> hired a tax expert to fully uh, review all of our tax laws, all of our regulations, all of our cases, and the full transcript of our case. This was Dr. Fiona Chen, and here's her uh her designations after her name. Dr. Fiona Chen, MPA, PhD, CPA, ABV, CFF, and CITP. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know what several of those even mean. <clears throat> but she has a PhD in taxation. <clears throat> and she was a former IRS agent. And she was used by the government to testify in tax cases as an expert witness on behalf of the government several times. So there's no disputing, even on the behalf of the government, that she was an expert witness, but she was not allowed to testify 
on our behalf. And here's what she wrote in in uh, her expert opinion um, <clears throat> on our behalf. She said, I am a former IRS revenue agent who was trained to examine taxpayers with respect to tax comp compliance, financial products they utilized, and various financial transactions. In this capacity, I was authorized to recommend criminal sanctions against those whose evidence demonstrated that they were committed committing tax fraud. <clears throat> I'm also a licensed CPA and a tax return preparer. I've spent the last six months exhaustively examining the Aegis systems. Aegis was the name of our company. The Aegis systems, the IRS rules, regulations, and various other resources that rel were relied upon by the Aegis principles in developing these systems, the correspondence between the IRS and Aegis principles, and the trial record, and the evidence presented by the U.S. Attorney's Office at trial. In my expert opinion, I cannot see anything amiss with any of the Aegis financial products in either its design or implementation. They are identical in most respects to financial products that have been lawfully used for decades, if not longer, by many, if not all, wealthy, high-asset families with business activities to minimize their U.S. tax liabilities, an activity which the Supreme Court has declared as fully lawful. In my expert opinion, both the pretrial press releases by the United States and the actual case presentation by the United States Attorney's Office in the courtroom were based upon, or were based more upon sensationalism than upon an inquiry into the lawfulness of the Aegis systems or upon the good faith of the defendant's reliance upon it. Both factors were critical in determining the guilt of the accused, while all the rational and scientific means of making such a determination were barred a priori. Latin term, which means presumed without evidence. <clears throat> the prosecution was allowed by the judge to cast common day-to-day -day lawful business practices, such as backdated signatures, quit claim deed types of title transfers, attorney drafted meeting minutes without the business's board of directors made face-to-face -face as nefarious and as certain evidence of fraud without rebuttal. It is my op opinion as an expert in these matters that these practices are not evidence of fraud to permit the trial to proceed in this fashion while simultaneously barring all such expert opinion taints the jury and predisposed it to convict the co-defendants. <clears throat> That's the way it works. That's the way it goes <clears throat> when they decide that nothing else is going to stand in their way. And then the jury can be manipulated according to that. Thank God that when in the courtroom of God, there is no jury. <clears throat> Nobody's going to get manipulated in the courtroom of God. We have a God who is righteous. It's not a jury trial. <clears throat> and at the same time, God is a formidable judge. <clears throat> uh, he is such a formidable judge that he's the one who wrote the law. <clears throat> the law that we're standing there accused of breaking, he wrote it. So he knows it. <clears throat> he's the source, the author of the law, the interpreter of the law of the law, the applier of the law. <clears throat> and so we go before him, we're glad for his justice, and at the same time we're fearful for his justice because <clears throat> it is his very justice from which we must be saved. It is his justice from which we must be saved. Next time we'll get into what that actually means. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll be finished. For